So, welcome back to the final item on uh, today's program, and that is a panel discussion about uh, universal basic income implemented or the possibility of it as a global project. And in our panel today, we have uh, Risto Marjoma, who already gave us a talk. He's the uh, a university lecturer, researcher, and docent in the University of Helsinki. Then we have Petteri Ratu, uh, the chairperson of Basic In. Income Earth Network in Finland, and then uh, introducing Heikki Patomäki, professor of political sciences in the at the University of Helsinki. Uh, his fields of research include global politics, uh, international relations, and future studies, to name a few. And then we have uh, the founder and chairperson of our own association, Global Business, Max Stahlberg. And he will now get, uh, present and introduce the topic of this panel discussion. So go right ahead, Max. Yeah, so the idea is to envision a world where, where there would be a global basic income implemented in every country in the world. Uh, the amount of this basic income should be unitary or at least unitary enough in all the different countries. Uh, when there would be differences, those would, would be motivated uh, through differences in living costs, so that in a place where the living costs would be higher, the basic income would also be higher. Um, and then this idea would also be coupled with the idea of the free movement of people, which means that each individual could freely choose where they would live, in which country or city, or, or, or move to any such, such place. Uh, and these two reforms would together be part of a global project in making the world a more just and equal place. Um, and to, together they could also in the future lead to even more utopian ideas such as a world citizenship or even a democratic world government. But these are of course just visions and utopias today. And yeah, the idea is here to look at the global basic income precisely from a visionary perspective. It's, it's of course not a possibility today or even tomorrow, uh, but if people could agree on its usefulness in a large enough level or on, on a large enough basis, then it could possibly be implemented at some point in the future. So this is the first step in, in that walk, but it's a long road of course. Uh, yeah, so Petteri Ratti already told us about the positive impacts that a basic income has on its recipients' lives. Um, so let's now turn to look at the global political changes that this could lead to. Uh, one could at least see that uh, there would be less polarization in the politics, both, both globally and nationally. Uh, there would also be more reasons for cooperation and less reasons to, reasons to wage wars. Yeah, but what are your thoughts regarding such big global political changes that this global basic income could lead to? Maybe, Mr. Patomäki, we could start with you since you are sort of new. Uh, you haven't had the uh, privilege of talking today yet, and then you are a professor of global politics. So maybe this is something that I can imagine you have a lot of lot to say about. Well, um, <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> the um, um, let me first say that the, uh, this idea is, is truly radical, uh, both the ideas actually, the, the free movement of people as well as the, um, the idea of basic income uh, conceived universally and globally at the same time. Now, um, the free movement of people uh, already goes against the basic principle of capitalist world economy, which is that the, we have separate nation states and the political systems within which we have regulation and taxation and, and possibly also democratic systems of governance and so on and so forth. And then we have world markets where things, uh, goods and capital can flow freely, but not people. So the uh, people are confined to the territories where they are located, typically to the countries um, of which they are citizens. And the, um, so the, there's a major limitation here. In the European Union, we have the principle of free movement of people, which means that people can reside in different countries of the um, EU. And they also then, um, the, um, they have the access to the social security system of those countries as well. If there was a European uh, basic income, it would also mean that they would have access to the, um, um, uh, to the income, sorry, basic income of that country where they reside, where they uh, would locate. Now, the, uh, one of the things that have been discussed in that context, which is much more limited than the global context, is whether the, uh, 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 there, there would be something like selective migration, people opting uh, 
uh, to live in those countries where there's a very high basic income. And the, um, um, so think about Finland, for instance, I mean, more than 1,000 euros per month uh, would be like uh, more than the, the average uh, salary of people living in Russia. And um, uh, the, um, in fact, quite a lot more. And for most Russians, if you take the median rather than the average income, the, um, it is more like uh, between 500 and 600 or 700 euros per month. So it would be quite tempting uh, to live in Finland. Of course, Russia is not a uh, European Union member country, but Romania, for instance, is. And Romania is actually poorer than Russia in that regard. So the, um, uh, that's one of the things that would have to be decided, uh, whether there is some kind of a system of exclusion of non-citizens or not. And the, globally, of course, this is even a bigger problem. But on the other hand, what, what this means, I mean, it's a twofold problem. On the one hand, the, um, um, those uh, countries that are considering the possibility of uh, uh, adopting this kind of a system of basic income, they would have to take some kind of a stance uh, to the problem whether they would need to exclude some people or not. If the idea is the free movement of people, then it seems that the only possibility is to realize basic income on a global scale at, at, at all at once. And, the, and this is, of course, a very utopian idea, it seems, at the moment, not, it, not least in terms of funding, but also in terms of um, setting the, the level of basic income as well. And um, so this is the problematic uh, th that we are talking about here. And, the, the, and, and this is why it is so radical to, to um, uh, demand two things simultaneously, free movement of people and basic income for everyone on the planet. And the, um, obviously, even much less than uh, 1,000 euros per month will change the life of many people living in the global south. Uh, some people have actually considered uh, basic income at the level of, let's say, 30 or 50 euros a month. And even that would actually double their incomes. Uh, and the, um, so uh, we can see what is at stake here. Um, the, my own uh, idea is that the, um, there are all kinds of practical difficulties uh, with both ideas, but they also point uh, toward a world where we have um, a truly global and cosmopolitan way of organizing things, where political legitimacy, um, political principles of making decisions about these kinds of things are somehow uh, global. And the, um, in order for them, uh, these kinds of systems and principles to be legitimate, uh, it requires something like global democracy as well. Otherwise, I mean, it can't be simply imposed um, upon different countries. And the um, Mario Ma actually, in his talk, uh, the, uh, said something about the consistency of the Chinese way of thinking about uh, uh, ethics in terms of non-interference in other countries' business. The, um, this is actually one of the main obstacles against uh, the idea of universal global basic income, because um, the, um, uh, how would it be possible to impose such an income uh, Two countries where uh, there's uh, reluctance to adopt anything like uh, basic income. So I leave it at here, but we can continue to discuss. Risto, you, you, in your your uh, lecture, you, you you discussed a lot of the current issues that, that the world has today. So uh, Patomaki was uh, said that this kind of uh, global basic income as a concept is a radical concept. So, uh, how do you feel about it? Could, it could, do, does the world of today need a radical changes or what's, what's your uh, take on this whole concept? Radical, yes. I don't think radical really covers it. <laughs> it should be a super radical. Or something. Um, world is like we do make it. Our world, the human world, is made by us. Our, our problems are made by us, and we can solve them. Uh, so, yes, we can do whatever we decide to do, at least try to do. I hate to always be the critic, but um, as far as you are talking about European Union or the Western world or the industrialized world, yeah, possibilities, yes, but... 
In Sub-Saharan Africa, in Nigeria, there are around 140 or 180 million people living there. There is a 40 million people gap. Very many countries in the world have no idea how many people are living in those countries. Um, there has been a United Nations program, uh, one dollar a day idea, although it's now uh, rising more like a two dollar a day, that the utmost poverty in the world should be cut by having people cross this limit, more than two dollars a day, let's say. But it's a sham because nobody lives in two, with two dollars a day. It means that you are living outside monetary economy. Hundreds of millions of people are living completely outside monetary economy. Uh, in many African countries, there are no taxes because there is no income. There is no way to count how income, where, where do you come, uh, where income comes. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, over 90% of the economic activity is gray, in, in the gray area. Whatever money the government is making is coming from uh, foreign concessions or tolls. They are unable to implement taxation. So in countries like this, to have this kind of, uh, of, of uh, service to give people to money each month, even a small amount of money, it will probably bring chaotic results because people are not actually buying their food or using money in almost anything at the moment, which means that now when they would have money to buy their food, it will drive the price of food up very rapidly because there, there, as there, there isn't a working market economy on foodstuff at the moment. So, yes, we can change the world 200 years, 300 years, <laughs> it's a possibility. But um, the, the, uh, you mentioned Iran. Okay, Iran is still a rather um, developed country and it has a very stable, uh, not a stable, but it has a clear um, level of income from its uh, oil, oil products. Kenya, I doubt it could, could have been higher than a village level, perhaps, the tra okay. because, yeah, because the, there is no Kenyan um, monetary society in the way we, we think about it. And so it will take a longer time. And the problem will be that, as we are seeing now with the European Union, when you get a club of states joining together and then they are opening borders within them, they are at the same time closing them for everybody outside. They are uh, creating their own club. We are now accepting less people from outside into the European Union due to Schengen uh, Treaty. Because we don't need those people, we get our uh, cheap workers from Romania or Bulgaria or, or Croatia or whatever. We don't need that much anymore. The idea that that like um, in Germany in 1960s, 1970s, uh, there were a large uh, number of people coming from Turkey, in, in Great Britain, from Pakistan, and so forth. So the problem is that if this would be created partially, and I don't see any other option than to create it partially, it might well lead into a world which is more divided into those who have and those who don't have than it is now, and thus the outcome would be the opposite of what is wanted. But again, I don't want to be the critic all the time. We can, of course, do things different. It's we who decide. But it's something which I often tell my, my students because they often regard my, my lectures as somewhat depressive. Uh, so during the last lecture, I usually tell them that, that yes, it could be that some things which I am saying are not very uplifting. But it's our world, 
and we make the decisions. But we can't make the right decisions unless we understand what the problem really is. Who, we have who to is be this we that you're talking about? Humankind. Humanity as a whole? Yes. As so, a whole. so you speak in the name of the humanity as a whole? No. I, I have no solutions myself. But humanity must have. It's the humanity which have created the problems, so it must have the answers. I don't have. I, I'm not pretending that I would know how, how to run countries like Mali or, or Malawi. They know. It's their country, not mine. I don't even know how to run Finland. The problems are so... But still, who else is going to have the answers if it's not us as a humankind? Yeah, but if the, if the Malawi, they are they rather than us. So no, for me, they us. are us. It's the humankind. I, I, I can't make this kind of distinction between people in different parts of the world. Because if you will start to make this distinction, then where does it end? But humanity as a whole doesn't have an agency. Yeah, I know. But as I said, it's not easy. As I said, um, I hate to be in this position of being a critic, but I'm not very optimistic that this, this will happen. But I don't see any other way that it might happen than to have basically the needs and the ideas of the whole world behind it. So are you saying that even for the global basic income to be even a realistic possibility that there is a need for a war or wide-ranging and greater solidarity between uh, the humanity as a whole. Well, uh, Petri Ratu, are you, the global basic income as a concept, are you, do you have a positive uh, approach or are you more critical about, about it uh, like on, as a concept? Uh, I, of course, from a practical perspective, I have to agree with uh, Risto here that the first step is getting people in the banking system. There are so many uh, people around the world who have no access to uh, banking systems at all that uh, that is a first step before we can think about UBI at all. Because as I said, one of the definitions for UBI was a cash-based system. So if you're not living in a uh, cash-based transfer, if you're not living in a cash-based system, the, <laughs> you have to first be brought into the system. Uh, but from a long-term perspective, we always, often lose sight in environmental discussions and so forth is that, for example, my kid is uh, likely to be alive in the year 2100. So uh, it's, uh, we live so long that it, to go to, let's say, 2200, uh, it's only a couple of generations uh, uh, forward. Uh, of course, uh, be, people probably will still keep having the kids at 30 and not like 50, but the uh, people who will be alive uh, in 2200 are not uh, born so far into the future that uh, uh, the change, if it starts happening, uh, could be done by people who are alive today. Uh, and from a European Union perspective, as we said here, we create barriers and from the free movement of people, there, is gen there are exceptions to it. And one of the exceptions is that you cannot move to another EU member state if you require social security. So uh, it is already a concept that uh, doesn't mismatch uh, match with the, ex you, would, you also need to change the existing EU rules for the free movement of people to be possible in connection with U UBI. Uh, it is in all, all these systems that we build, we tend to create exceptions for people who have nothing to begin with. And from a majority rule perspective, this whole mindset will need to change first. Since we, are, we were discussing the, the, the issue of basic income being a, a tied to the monetary system uh, and the problems that are related to that on a global level, maybe next uh, we, we could uh, transfer to the, the, the topic of economic uh, implications and the economic elements of global basic income. So maybe, Max, you could now share your thoughts about the, the ec economic side of, of global basic income and we can shift to that. Yeah, well, uh, at least economic inequality will lessen as a result. So, so that will be an important, important point here. Then, and yeah, there will be many other things, of course, as well. Uh, so maybe we can look at this. And then I also start to think about 
okay, a global basic income is, is highly unrealistic at the moment, but if you take a na- nation state perspective and see that certain nation states apply it and then others do the same afterwards, what, what changes could this then lead to? Who is going to start? <laughs> okay. Um, le- first of all, I mean, as far as the economic effects are concerned, I mean, the most important transformative effect, direct effect, is actually monetization and commodification of the economy. And the, uh, it depends, of course, on the context. And for instance, um, in a um, country like Finland, the um, uh, what kinds of systems of social security it might replace. But the, um, in some visions, um, originally the idea was proposed by Milton Friedman, as we know, and the, um, uh, that was a very neoliberal idea in many ways. And his idea was to replace all forms of uh, uh, social security and public welfare uh, provisions and, and uh, free, uh, public education and everything uh, with uh, basic income to everyone, which means that the, there are only private markets for everything. And, the, um, and, and this is a vision that uh, many have been following, and it's not always clear what the position of different parties, let's say, in Finland in that regard is. Uh, to what extent they, for instance, allow for um, decommodification in certain areas of economic life. For instance, I mean, classical social democracy was based on the idea of decommodifying education and health to major areas. So we actually provide free education for everyone, independently of their income. Uh, so, And we still follow this principle, despite many efforts during the past 15 years or so to introduce student fees at the university level or higher education level. The, um, we still have free education for the students. And the, um, another example is, of course, uh, universal health care that everybody is entitled to uh, free healthcare, uh, or almost free. In the case of Finland, it's, it's become a kind of a semi-privatized system already in many ways, and it's also a dual track system. We have a totally private part as well and so on. But nonetheless, I mean, the, the classical social democratic idea was to have universal healthcare for everyone for free. And the, so it's decommodified in the sense that there is no market for it. It's not a thing that you can buy and sell, sell in the marketplace. Whereas the basic income very often means that you transform things that are not uh, commodities yet into commodities. So you monetize and commodify. In the case of Kenya, for instance, I mean, the, or in a, any a country like that, where the, in the countryside people are still living in subsistence economy. The, what happens is very often that the, if you want to replace the traditional sources of um, the uh, living the, um, uh, with this kind of a basic income, you actually make them poorer than they used to be. And the, uh, so the, um, the monetary value of what they were producing uh, for their own use uh, is much higher than 50 or 100 euros per month. And the, they only use cash for uh, buying certain extra things that they can't actually produce themselves. Whereas in, 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 Nairo, in big cities like Nairobi, everything is already totally commodified and monetized. And the, um, uh, so the majority of African people are uh, living nowadays in a monetized and commodified economy, but not all of them, and particularly in, in the countryside, in the rural areas, that's not the case yet. What the basic income basically would do or could do in those kinds of contexts, depending, of course, what things you would leave intact, is the process of commodification and monetization of the economy. As far as the um, more macroeconomic effects are concerned, it depends entirely on whether it is neutral uh, with regard to the uh, uh, average income of people. And then there is also the difference between, let's say, unemployment benefits and basic income. If you have a if you replace unemployment benefits uh, with basic income, what happens is that the, the so-called automatic stabilizers in the economy become less important. And the, um, so it's actually uh, a worse system in terms of Keynesian demand management than the current system. Where we have a, when, when we have um, uh, economies sliding into recession or depression and more people getting unemployed, uh, what happens is that the the, um, the incomes are, uh, to a large degree, replaced with this, uh, uh, with this uh, unemployment benefit. 
So there's a sudden change, new source of income for people. But if you simply have a kind of a flat rate basic income independently of the business cycles, what happens is that the, uh, nothing changes. So there's much less automatic stabilization in the economy. You have already discussed the uh, uh, various uh, effects that a basic income could have on countries or states that are uh, presently in Africa and how would they would be radically changed. Uh, going back to the lecture by Juristo Marjama, would you consider this uh, like because we're talking about the economic effects? Uh, is this is is there a danger of this being? yet another colonization project or do you think that there's like a global basic income could it be uh, some sort of like uh, tool for actually doing uh, implementing global justice uh, actually and not making just it just a colonization project well like um, like so many economic policies it's down to the moral issues behind that, what you are actually trying to do with it that's decisive. You can easily use this kind of system to build a new colonial world. Actually, we live in a colonial world, you, you only need to uh, retain uh, the economic system we have now. Um, could you change this system into something else? Yes, of course you can. There, there is nothing to There is nothing to prevent us to change the world at, as it uh, is. The only problem is that it can become worse. So it's the outcome that defines, not the possibilities that that we have. But the idea, hmm, let's say one rich state would apply this system. If that would fail, then nobody would copy it. Okay, that's the end. If it would succeed, then everybody would like to come into this country and profit from that, so it would have to close its borders for outsiders. Others would like to copy a similar system, but by copying a similar system, they might actually um, have a negative effect of the income of the one who first got this good idea. So I'm not sure I'm seeing At what point would there be a combination? Would this only mean that if it's a success, successful project in one country, it's applied also in some other countries, perhaps most, most, most countries, but why would they join together? Where, where do you get this? At what point they would give up their borders if they are already succeeding inside their own countries? In that point, you would have to find some kind of... Um, human empathy towards the world or whatever you, you would like. So let's say Finland would apply for this uh, and then Mali. Would that mean that we would somehow want to join together with Mali because it would still have a di quite different level of its success would be rather different success than our success. I don't see at what point we are going to level up the world by this manner and if we fail to level up then we will have borders because otherwise people will be rushing to where they can succeed you can see that in in poor countries uh, large poor countries like let's say nigeria uh, or congo um, their main centers are becoming huge slums because people from other parts of the country are rushing into this one place where they might be work. And that cannot be prevented because you are inside uh, the same political system. So unless you can find a way to implement a system in which everybody is in somewhat equal level, then there will be It would be unlikely that borders could be lowered any more than is the case with European Union at the moment, when people from Africa are... There is no other way for the Africans to go except north. So there will be increasing uh, push on our borders, and I think that will probably lead into um, cutting, uh, into making the borders stronger, not lower.
And this is a problem. But again, I'm not against the idea itself, but it's a problem how to implement. The, the leveling depends entirely whether there are um, redistributional effects on a global scale. Mm. Yes. And the, um, at the moment, the, uh, the total development aid, aid is um, at the level of 100 billion a year or something like that. So if you divide that uh, among the three billion worst of people in the world, all of them would get something like $33 per year, which is not that much, right? So you would need different sources of income in order to do anything like that. And the question becomes, of course, if you want to redistribute in that way, whether that's the best option to distribute money to uh, individual uh, consumption, or whether you would rather uh, use that money for public investment programs, or the universal education for, or developing universal education for everyone. How could that be funded? I mean, there are all kinds of possibilities. I've been advocating global taxes for uh, the past 25 years, more or less, and there are different possibilities. Financial transaction tax, greenhouse gas tax, uh, arms trade tax, and so on and so forth. So there are plenty of different possibilities for uh, creating revenues on a global scale and then use that for the redistribution uh, globally. But the, um, uh, the leveling depends on this. If you just let Mali to develop its own system of basic income on the basis of domestic uh, resources, there will be no leveling. We, we heard uh, uh, in the case of Finland, for example, to have uh, a r- actual universal basic income that the amount would very quickly li- uh, increase to the sum of the uh, whole uh, nation's budget. So, do, Petr, do you uh, have any thoughts concerning about the the funding of a basic income on a global level? Do you think that... that uh, or redistribution, which was discussed, would be an effective way of, of, of pursuing uh, a concept such as this. Uh, one, there's one ongoing uh, redistribution discussion in, in connection with the climate talks, which is that the countries that have basically emitted nothing want something in return from the industrialized nations. And Maybe if we look at this, like a smaller example that I could see implemented is that the nations who are basically going to be underwater, the people have to go somewhere and who, who takes them. It could be solved by the global community gave, gave, giving them an UBI and they could choose where to go live with that. That could be one practical example that I, I could see working where we could try, uh, where there would be uh, the moral justification from the global to community to pay, some, uh, pay a limited group UBI. Because... Uh, I don't see. Uh, it's probably uh, currently it looks to be very uncontrolled, but it would easy, uh, at least provide them a, a clear route to migrate somewhere where no one would be objecting them come to coming on the individual burden uh, perspective when they would be paying their rent from uh, their UBI. So this uh, certainly so uh, there's a problem between the. Uh, high income countries and the the countries that would be classified as a low and middle income countries so maybe we can uh, use this as transition for uh, discussing the, the the impacts of a global basic income that it could have uh, on uh, for the people in low and middle income countries so max do you have uh, some introductory thoughts about this topic Uh, well, well, if you look at the experiments in India, for instance, they have they have big good results with a basic income. So, could could countries which would in some way be be still functioning, could they benefit from this basic income? The, the individual people in in those countries, even if it's it's not a good idea in, in other countries. Thank you, please. Mm. Well, um, as I said, I mean, people, particularly living in cities. And the majority of humanity is nowadays living in cities already. Um, and if you take towns into account as well, I mean, most of those people are living in a in a market society anyway already. And in in those kinds of contexts, I mean, think about a slum dweller in Calcutta or Nairobi or whatever a place like that. I mean, they would of course obviously benefit a lot uh, from even a small basic income like fifty or one hundred dollars a month, and the, uh, that would make a big difference to their lives. 
And I actually could, uh, the um, envision the possible very beneficial effects, uh, local effects uh, of that kind of a cash transfer to these people, because it would actually the, um, increase the, the amount of demand in those local contexts for all kinds of goods and services. So it would actually make the, um, the, uh, the local economy uh, in those parts of those big cities to thrive, I, I would say. And the, uh, so in that way, it could have uh, very beneficial effects. Um, so the, it, it depends a lot on the context and then, of course, also on how it's funded and where the money is actually coming from and so on and so forth. And the, uh, so there are all kinds of practical things that you need to take into account. Or some of them we have discussed already, I mean, technical issues, but there are also much more complicated issues uh, related to the uh, way taxation operates in different uh, countries and, and those kinds of things as well. Please, yeah. Risto, please. You had you had a point. That you, uh, yeah, you were. I have I have an um, example where you could uh, start w- with Cuba. It's a country with a very high level of education. Uh, it has um, uh, free health care, but it's a very poor country. I think that Cuba will really benefit very very much if, from this kind of. It could. Uh, consume and use the money in a profitable way because it already has a high level of, of, of uh, education. It already has the administrative system, productive system. All it needs is income to put into the system. So if you need to have an example of a middle middle uh, level state where this could probably be very, very beneficial. But then, of course, you need to have where, where this money is coming from. But it would probably be very beneficial there. And Cuba being a socialist state, they would not really even struggle against the idea of, 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 of a basic uh, basic salary to everyone. You already mentioned the posi- uh, the some of the possible negative effects in countries that the, most of the econo- economy works in a gray economy and introducing uh, to that from that perspective a very radical idea such as a basic income, but also. Discuss, uh, you discussed that one of the most important matters of today uh, in your lecture was the the consumption. And, and so, uh, what about the if, if we again regard especially the low income countries? Uh, is there a, a threat or a risk that uh, introducing such a radical? Uh, change into those uh, economies such as a basic income would also increase the general consumption in those countries and 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 push them towards a more uh, western way of, of 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 living where the consumption is 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 somewhat uh, uh, important or it's it's very defining of those of our western cultures better rather please um, uh, for sure, it would do that. That's a very clear uh, connection with like uh, people receiving more money, and they would uh, uh, consume more if they have uh, ba- quite basic needs to fill. But if we look at the balance in effects, if it's a tax on, let's say, greenhouse gases, it's by majority consumed by a very small group of people. If the financing is coming from us taking uh, flights to uh, uh, across the world for our holidays then the net benefit is much less clear. Uh, it could be even beneficial uh, easily for the, uh, envi- uh, from the environmental perspective if it's taxed, coming from tax revenues that then reduce the emissions more that the new consumption causes. Yes, and, and, and w- while we are on the subject uh, on, of uh, consumption and, and the environment, uh, <clears throat> we maybe we could uh, elaborate on that theme that what possible environmental effects the global basic income could have and maybe since we are all already on the topic uh, one question that i would wanted to have asked uh, uh, during the first lecture of today was that if the no, one of the number one issues of today's world is the the, the uh, consumption especially in the Western world. So uh, is there a 
a possibility that the global basic income could be harnessed with a project where the consumption is lessened and we try to strive towards more uh, towards a world where uh, we are to do with less but with a global basic income our basic needs are are, are fulfilled please Risto uh, I think we will have to whatever happens I, I don't see any option we might perhaps find solution to energy problem find a, a way to make cleaner energy but we can't change the problem of resources there simply ain't enough resources in this planet to maintain this level of of uh, consumption for all the people there is it's a mathematical impossibility so whatever solution we take it must include also lowering the consumption in the western world there there's no option to that <clears throat> two two points i'm i'm also uh, in favor of the growth in that sense uh, or at least zero growth because um the um this decoupling between um the uh, the emissions and and economic growth hasn't happened in the way that would actually sustain economic growth in the long run and we have also many other ecological problems as well um but the um to, there's a tendency to uh, be too romantic or um, exotic or exotistic uh, mm-hmm. about the global south i mean think about country like india which is one of the most um unequal countries in the world the second after south africa in fact and the um these inequalities actually mean that there's a uh, a big group of people about 100 million people at least who are living like upper class finnish uh, life i mean the, the the very privileged people in finland are having that kind of a standard of living and the um in these big cities i mean these people live side by side with these uh, slum dwellers or people who are just sleeping rough on the streets um the visiting a place like calcutta it was very famous in the 1970s as the, the most miserable place on the planet and uh, it was still when i visited it in the late 2000s it was very much like that and if, if you go to the city center i mean all the buildings are like falling apart and And people are, I mean, there are like literally piles of people uh, just lying in the streets. And the, uh, I mean, it's unimaginable, I mean, the place. And then you take a taxi to a, a shopping mall. All these fantastic shops from all around the world. Everything is air conditioned, clean, hygienic. And there are rich people who are enjoying all this all the time. And the, um, so totally two totally different uh, ways of living. I, I even remember one. The, we had to. Uh, I was with um, uh, the African UN civil servant, and the uh, Indians were very uh, racist uh, toward him. And the, but anyway, so we went to this shopping mall, and he needed to exchange uh, money, and and the um, and there was a Chinese guy who was the um, also exchanging money for a big football team that, that was playing there at that time, and. And he, so he was needing a lot of cash, so we had plenty of time to discuss things. And he said, like, I, he can't imagine how these people are living like animals here in, in Calcutta. Mm-hmm. And it is true for the really poor people in, in places like that. I mean, the, it's, and at the same time, if you look at the figures of pollution, for instance, and Indian cities are the most polluted cities in the world. The amount of plastic that they uh, put into the seas every year is incredible absolutely incredible so the amount of consumption happening in india is already huge and the um, and it is not ecologically more sound or anything like that so i don't think basic income actually is uh, is the real issue here there are other things other processes and other mechanisms that will, will need to uh, to be uh, reshaped transformed in order uh, to prevent that from happening And uh, basic income is is kind of a secondary issue as far as pollution is concerned, for instance. So for a global basic income, if we would even want to entertain the idea as a a utopian idea, idea, it would have to be coupled with uh, things such as degrowth, uh decrease in consumption. Selective degrowth in different places, in different ways. Petre, do you have any take on this? 
Uh, a couple of takes on it. Uh, one thing is the population growth, uh, given how long people live. Uh, that uh, ex- uh, In Finland, we are used to the pyramid being quite different, but globally speaking, there are quite a f- uh, countries where the average age is well below 20. I think um, something like that, maybe recent was better, but like some, somewhere there, yeah. uh, young people anyway are dominating the country. So they're go- going to be alive for a- 80 years. So we're not going to change the amount of people radically going forward. It will plateau and go down. And maybe here is also related to that, the good thing to mention this uh, white all male panel is maybe ill equipped to consider the effects on females in uh, uh, those countries. but. Uh, I could foresee UBI having quite interesting dynamic effects in uh, countries that are used to uh, very male-dominated household hierarchies when the female would have access to their cash flows. Well, would the male then take it to their own use? I don't know. But uh, uh, it could tie into, let's say, uh, access to contraceptives, for example, when they could buy them with their own money and things like that that are not easily accessible. And all these dynamics are... Uh, be, 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 may well beyond my uh, understanding and pay grade at least. So we we have uh, touched upon a lot of themes here, and and uh, now maybe Max, if you have still some some, we have uh, about ten minutes. So if there's any 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 other topics that you would want our panelists to elaborate, I would. It would be great to hear your thoughts on now, on yeah. whatever. Yeah, well, I would be interested in hearing more about the taxation of of a, of a basic income and, and the green taxation and, and the possibilities here in a carbon tax, for instance. So could, if the taxation would be sorted out in a good way, could it have beneficial effects on the environment, for instance? But do you feel, Heikki, please. Well, um, global greenhouse gas tax is um, one of my favorite ideas, and I'm, I'm working on that all the time. The... Um, um, it, it can have a, a true potential and it is also in a sense politically more feasible than other possibilities. I mean, there have been discussions about currency transaction tax and financial transaction tax. That was in the uh, aftermath of the Asian crisis and then the global financial crisis uh, when it looked like um, as a real possibility. But at the moment, I mean, I think the global greenhouse gas tax is the most uh, the um, feasible possibility that we can imagine, given that there's an increasing concern about the uh, accelerating rate of global warming. And so something more has to be done. And the um, uh, the trading uh, of emissions, I mean, that system is uh, clearly very deficient. It has not been able to make any major difference. In fact, the um, emissions have been going up every year. And last year, 2021, the emissions were at a higher level than ever before. And this year will break the records once again. And the, um, so it, it, there has been no... Uh, Leveling, not to talk about decline in emissions, uh, given the measures that have been taken so far. I mean, the, uh, we can conceive the global greenhouse gas tax in different ways, but what makes it politically uh, more interesting than many other po- uh, possibilities that have been discussed in these global summits is that you don't need the consensus of every country uh, to, to realize it. Um, what you only need is a coalition of the willing, some 20 or 30 countries to start with, and then they could implement the system and, and start to, uh, they would create a global fund, and, and preferably democratically controlled global fund, and then uh, they could invite other countries to join in uh, later on. And, the, um, and then the system can be devised in such a manner that the other, the outsiders would have an incentive to take part in the system over time. Uh, for instance, I mean, using these um, uh, carbon customs, for instance, against the outsiders. So by joining, they could actually join also the benefits, but if, being the outside, they could actually be forced to pay uh, for, the, for the bads, not the goods uh, as well. Anyway, um, so that kind of a system is within the um, reach of real political possibilities. A globally, truly global, universal uh, greenhouse gas uh, tax could yield revenues at the level of 500 billion uh, euros per year or more. That's five, five times more than all the um, uh, development aid of all the countries uh, combined at the moment. 
It is uh, about 50 times more than the budget of the United Nations. It is 10 times more than the, the level of lending of the IMF or the World Bank. So it would make a real difference. And with 500 billion, you can actually do quite a lot, including in terms of public investment programs, also to compensate for the effects of uh, global warming. Uh, the, um, you can also use it for other purposes, like developing education in certain places, or perhaps introducing uh, basic income for certain targeted groups or countries or places or locations. Uh, so that's a possibility as well. So we could con conceive a, a basic income for some people on the planet um, funded globally, without that being totally universal, because that's it's, we don't necessarily have to wait for 100 or 200 years for anything that, like that to become possible, but it will uh, still take a long time and there are all kinds of obstacles and there are also undesired effects as well. But in certain targeted contexts, it could actually make a very positive impact. Or I had a better. Uh, yeah, so if you look at the Finnish state budget, there is already an income line that is from the initial emission of trading rights. So we already have the system that is bringing in money to the state coffers. Uh, so if you want it, now it's used on renewable investment, I think, because the EU requires it, but there's no s saying that that could be redirected to uh, a UBI. Uh, just have to comment on why the ETS doesn't work, the emissions trading system in reducing emissions. It's not because of the market mechanism, it's because the politicians have... Uh, been very lackluster in the targets of the system. Uh, they have just decided we're going to give so many rights that it doesn't in practice reduce the emissions. It, the same thing would happen with carbon tax, that like if they set the carbon tax lo too low, it would again not reduce the emissions. So it's not really, in my opinion, uh, 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 and, uh, a, a difference between the systems. It's always about political uh, political ambition. If the ambition isn't there, it doesn't really matter what uh, system you're aiming for. Well, we could discuss that point at some length, but it would take us from the main issue here, which is basic income. Risto, please. Um, if you meant on, on individual level, um, using this kind of system to make us lower our emissions, then it might work in Finland. I could see it working in Cuba as well. But we have many Indians in the world, and in those countries, the poor people, they can't change the way they are living because they are living in such a poor conditions that, that it's their way of survival. In many cases, they know that they are destroying the environment around them, but they can't do anything about it because it's the only way they can survive. And for the rich people, they, they wouldn't care. Uh, the tax would would really affect them in any way. So this kind of system would possibly work on consumption in uh, countries where you have a middle class who have a high consumption level in order to push their consumption level down. But I don't see it working in in, in poor countries. There you would need to have some kind of state state uh, effect. Better, please. Uh, even in Finland, there are still interesting thought experiments to be had. For example, we do not currently tax the logs that people uh, uh, burn in their fireplaces. Mm. So uh, it's a crude analog, but if, if you think, uh, how would you feel about the state putting a tax on the firewood you put in your uh, own fireplace? And that uh, is uh, somewhat uh, analogous to uh, then we would start taxing these low-income people because we're very direct at the point of causing the emissions. Mm -hmm. We get away with it in here because the uh, city of Helsinki owns a big power plant there and pays the uh, money for us and then we just wonder why the uh, uh, heating bills are what they are and don't really realize it. Um, but when it becomes much more closer to the individual where it has to be in these uh, countries without centralized systems, it becomes much less different human dynamic. Now that we have uh, about five minutes left, uh, <clears throat> it would be interesting since uh, Risto, you said that uh, a lot of the times the students say that at the end of, the, of your series of lectures that, that you give a 
quite bleak picture of the world and the future. So maybe since we are discussing uh, such a uh, utopian theme such as a global basic income, my, m- maybe we could end this panel discussion by uh, on a on a positive note and and be quite free to go to be utopians and even radicals and uh, picture if 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 we would imagine a global basic income as a possibility be it as utopian and radical as, as it might what would be the 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 road leading up to the implementation of it it's a hard question but let's yeah petteri uh, i don't have any exact thoughts but humans seem to be good at making uh, radical changes in a crisis that is sudden but uh, that uh, requires then the sudden crisis that would trigger uh, uh, us coming together and putting the I- UBI together. And uh, that is maybe hard to imagine what would be such an event. Climate change or the effects of climate change. Well, well we, we haven't done anything for the <laughs> X decade. Well, I mean, that's one possible scheme. and, and uh, But I think it's um, slightly irresponsible to um, uh, to wish for such a global catastrophe <laughs> that would wreak um, radical utopian changes in the world system. I mean, as much as I hope for radical utopian changes and not only basic income, but in many other ways as well, and perhaps uh, precisely in many other ways as well. The, um, uh, I think that's something that has to be avoided. If you want to um, be have a kind of a realistic and moral analysis of the situation at the moment. We have to be able to figure out alternative ways. Think about the um, the creation and establishment of the welfare state in Finland after the Second World War. Obviously, there was the war as a kind of a crisis, but it was actually a very long-term project, and it was based on the uh, uh, the rising political agency of trade unions and, and and left parties and so on and so forth. And and this was also part of the Bretton Woods Agreement that was made at the um, end of the Second World War that precisely enabled the possibility of building democratic welfare states at home. And it was devised in such a manner. And, the, uh, and this was uh, basically negotiated with the US and the UK delegations in, in Bretton Woods in 1944. Um, the more radical vision of Keynes was never realized, but nonetheless, the system, as long as the economy, world economy, was not uh, truly globalized, yet it worked quite well. And that was the context within which these political struggles took place. So we need some kind of an agency. We need to have some kind of an understanding about the, the real world processes and mechanisms that are producing the outcomes that we are seeing, including all these very problematic tendencies, including the once a global catastrophe. And then somehow the, this agency would need to be able to shape these processes in a manner that will create uh, alternative possibilities. And it's not a coincidence that I mentioned the possibility of a global greenhouse tax, gas tax, because I think that that's a, a possible way forward, but given that we already are heading towards a crisis and there's a kind of a crisis sentiment, but the true crisis hasn't happened yet. And the, uh, so in an anticipatory manner, um, and given also that there's a global climate movement as well, so we have elements of agency already in place. And if this combination might actually be able to realize something like a global greenhouse gas tax. And a breakthrough in one area of global governance of that magnitude would actually create, change the entire context of world politics uh, for many decades and even centuries to come. So uh, it, it would be a radical rupture of the system in a way. And so. I must clarify that I'm not wishing for crisis, but all things point to, for example, pandemics being more often than uh, uh, in, in history. So Risto, now you're on the spot. You have to give. Yes. Uh, you end up on a positive note and yes, and, and, li- and and let us go home feeling a little optimistic about the future. Yes, I, I really have an optimistic ending. By small te- steps, in 1856 in Paris was created the first international treaty of any kind. The first in which. An idea was created that there can be something which is universally acceptable. It dealt with the maritime, uh, maritime trade and, and uh, privateers, doesn't matter here. But in less than 200 years, we have come to a phase where we have a huge amount of international treaties which are covering almost everything. 
almost all space of our living in some way. So small steps. I think that many utopias are being destroyed by hoping too much too quickly. Thank you so much. And, and Max, do you have any, any closing words? Uh, well, I also want to thank the audience and our guests. This was really interesting and yeah, interesting in many ways and many new things come, came up and yeah, thank you. Thank you on my part as well. It's been very interesting discussion with you all and, and thank you all for coming here to be here with us today and this all. Everything has been recorded, so we will have uh, uh, videos next year for everyone to join uh, who has been here, but also especially for those who haven't. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.